I don't know. That's, that's a good question. Who would be? What would the general populace be more skeptical of, Bigfoot or aliens? If I ever get abducted by aliens, I'm going to ask them, what's the deal with Bigfoot? Definitely. I mean, Bigfoot, no question. But I'm definitely more tailored to be fascinated by ufology. There is something that those people are drawn to. I love exploring that plane. It's color. It's joy. It's mystery. And living in that mystery. I really think that it's okay that people go out in search of these things and want to know more about life beyond where we are. There, there's something there. I really think people who go in search of Bigfoot, and I think people who go in search of aliens, I think they're very similar. And, and here's why. A lot of people who study, and there are people who take just simply a scholarly academic approach to the study of the unknown. And that's what science is all about. You have a question that you don't know the answer to. You have a hypothesis. You test that hypothesis with evidence. And if your hypothesis proves to be untrue, you come back and you rehypothesize. Uh, it was Harry and the Hendersons, the movie Harry and the Hendersons, that, that really sparked my interest in Bigfoot. And similarly to E.T., which sparked my interest in extraterrestrials, right? There was this infusion of love, of tenderness, of kindness in both of those films. And so from the earliest age, my interest in anything paranormal, extraterrestrial in origin was grounded in this, this idea that perhaps there are species out there yet undiscovered or proven to exist in the mainstream that are not caged and restricted by the same kind of shortcomings that human beings have. The biggest difference between cryptozoology and ufology, whether it's doing research, speaking at conferences, lectures, TV shows, things like that, the biggest difference is that a lot of UFO research is sort of historical, going through files, speaking with witnesses. Cryptozoology, because it's the study of unknown animals, there's a great deal of research done out in the field, in forests, in woods, in lakes, mountains. So cryptozoology lends it more to expeditions and being on the road, whereas ufology is scrutinizing cases, you know, and documents and files. So one is very much outdoors, another one is pouring over material, that kind of thing. So. So there's definitely a little bit of a difference, I think, between the UFO and uh, Bigfoot community. Bigfoot community tends to be a little more grounded. A lot of these guys are just guys that live out in the woods. You know, they're pretty down to earth. And they know their animals, they know their species, you know, they just... Either have, had, when, have seen something unusual they can't explain, you know? They don't think of it in terms of, I think, so much in terms of, like, anthropology or biology, a lot of these guys, because these guys, some of these guys are hunters, or they're just guys that live out, you know, in the woods, and they're pretty regular people. It doesn't attract as many crazy people to, or let's say delusional, to be honest, you know, as the UFO field does. And it's not as, there's less politics. I think, especially today, the UFO field is very politically motivated. You know, everything, it's, it's been hijacked a little bit by a certain group of people that, where, you are, where UFOs are coming second behind their worship of certain politicians or you know, it's, it gets tied up with like the QAnon phenomena, which I personally think is utterly ridiculous. You know, so there's a lot more conspiracy theories out there that I think are kind of going off the deep end and it attracts a lot of those guys. Yeah, it's interesting because there, there is not much cultural crossover between the alien fans, the ancient alien fans, the conspiracy theorists about governments and, and stuff like that, the Bigfoot people, the ghost people. And there really should because basically we're all the same in the sense, if you put us all together, you'd have a really, really massive block of, of voters and political activists because we're all people that recognize in one way or another that the world that we're presented on TV is not reality, that there is a much deeper, 
maybe darker, but certainly more interesting reality that we exist in than what we're, we're sold every day. There's a lot more things going on than just who's going to win the Super Bowl, the Chiefs, by the way. Um, you know, there's more stuff going on than that. And, and the, you know, the impeachment farce that's going on right now, it's all, it's all for show and it's all to keep us distracted from the ghosts and the Bigfoots and the things that don't fit and the aliens and the ancient aliens. It's to keep us from really focusing on the truth because if we did focus on that, we might get distracted and not really think it was that important to go to work tomorrow. And that's what keeps the engine of civilization running. We had a fascinating conversation with Mike Barra on the way up the mountain. He was tired. This is before this whole uh, virus thing came out. And he started, he was saying that, yeah, I got an insider, CIA guy, that has said that we have a virus that targets certain ethnic groups, if you want. And we're, and the whole, t everybody in the truck were just like, what are you talking about? And it's right as the whole thing was kind of breaking free, but it doesn't look like that was the, you know, it, it just started in China or whatever, but it, it was, that's, you know, you get all kinds of insider info from these guys. And then when they say they got a contact, it's hard not, you know. I really think that it's okay that people go out in search of these things and want to know more about space and want to know more about life beyond where we are. We have predilections to violence, to disorder, vengeance, anger, hatred, all these things. And, and when I saw those movies when I was a child, I thought, what if there really is a species out there that was kind? and compassionate, and they were not a species of, of war or conflict. Um, they were a scientific species, right? Like E.T., the extraterrestrial, or Harry and the Hendersons, that maybe all these sightings of Bigfoots, which keep their distance for the most part, Sasquatch or Yeti, that they're intelligent enough to stay away from us because maybe they don't want to get involved with our conflicts and they can see how aggressive we can be. Not that we always are, um, but we have people out there that are actually with guns hunting for Bigfoot, which I just think is absolutely absurd. And um, I highly, highly condemn it. I mean, it really just ticks me off that people would do that. Um, because there's just not enough good evidence that I've seen that Bigfoot or Sasquatch is aggressive and violent towards human beings. Um, they may be at times confrontational in that they approach and come close to us, uh, to eyewitnesses. But that does not justify looking for a trophy just to prove that some species exists. Because again, for me, it, it's something more meta. It's bigger. The, the search for strange creatures or extraterrestrials visiting here, whatever you're searching for, for me, it all means something much bigger than ourselves. For me, that's one of the main reasons why I kind of like cryptozoology in many ways more than ufology, because I enjoy the sort of road trip expedition aspect of it, hitting the road and potentially, you know, staking out at a lake where something's been seen for seven days. You know, for me, that's more exciting than just pouring over something that's been released under the Freedom of Information Act from 50 years ago, which is really still cool material, but I kind of like that sort of hitting the road angle more than anything else. Yeah. Personally, I think both UFOs and Bigfoot are equally believable, but for different reasons. I think because the UFO phenomenon, we have so much evidence now, I don't want to say proof because we don't have the smoking gun, you know, but obviously recently we've seen how various governments, including ours, have admitted to the fact that there are flying objects out there they can't explain. We have uh, a paper trail, you know, that, for example, John Greenwald at the Black Vault has been able to dig up that talk about UFOs from official capacity in the U.S. government. Other, you know, governments around the world have admitted to the fact that, yeah, these things fly around. We have a plethora of footage at this point. I mean, granted, a lot of it's fake, but a plethora of good footage, pictures, accounts, you know, throughout the entire world. So there's a lot there. You know, with Bigfoot, we have much less. I think, and, but on the other hand, um, 10 years ago, I would say UFOs are more believable than Bigfoot, but since we've, all, all that we know now about the fossil record and much further back, we go back through genetics, 
have proven that something like Bigfoot not only could exist, but did exist, you know, like a bunch of times in the last few million years. So if it was possible then, certainly there's no reason for it not to be possible now. The only question is whether it could stay hidden in the modern world. Definitely. I mean, Bigfoot, no question. It's out there, but I'm definitely more um, tailored to be fascinated by ufology and, and the technology. And Dude, I have no problem whatsoever with a person who wants to know or go out and investigate whether or not there's life beyond our solar system. I don't know how you do that. I have, through my involvement with UFO research for the government and now I suppose as, as somebody who writes and broadcasts on this, I interact with the UFO community. I, I have a good knowledge, I suppose, of, of ufology, for want of a better word. I know that there are other mysteries, other fields of study. So we have, for example, all sorts of anomalous creatures seen all around the, the world, monsters and, and um, I suppose most famously Bigfoot, say, and you have the whole cryptozoological community. I suspect there are similarities and differences between those communities. Well, I've been interested in, yeah, I guess a lot of different things, but to, to see the intertwining of the ufology, ufology, we have that subject, but when you start going down that road and you start opening that, that box, it's literally Pandora's box because you will discover, as I have, what is reality? What are we doing here? Why, what, what, are, what is a human being? What is the purpose of our existence? You know, all of these big, big questions you ask and you go deeper and you go deeper and you may find some answers, you may find, you know, and it's very individualized, but uh, it's all interconnected. So ghosts, you know, you mentioned Bigfoot earlier, you know, the indigenous teachings, cultures, other religious belief systems, it's all connected and it's all intertwined to the bigger, greater story of what is it to be human. So I think the positive and negative are two sides of the same coin for both cryptozoology and ufology. So again, the seeking, I think, is a, a sort of mystical quest. So ghost hunters, um, cryptozoologists, ufologists, whatever it is, they are seeking something that is bigger than what conventional thinking tells us our reality is beyond our five senses. And science has teased this, right? That the world is so much bigger. The universe is so much more magical and diverse than we may have imagined. But it seems to me that our imagination often drives the search for answers. We have to sort of imagine what could be before we can even seek it. And so the idea that we can imagine that there might be these elementals or spirits or ghosts or chupacabras or Bigfoot, that there might be extraterrestrials visiting our Earth from another planet, that fills us with a wonder that I think just sort of feeds the spirit of living that it makes life exciting and in the search for that i think there is something almost spiritual about it and i think that is a very positive thing now some people might like they use other things fill the void um but i think most people it's not a void that they're filling it's just living the journey of life and you know going down the enigmatic road of investigation into the unknown is something that broadens the mind. In some sense, both communities would regard themselves as somewhat fringe and are regarded as somewhat fringe and maybe eccentric by, for example, the mainstream scientific community. A lot of these people might regard themselves as I don't know, outsiders, crusaders for the truth in a situation where maybe they feel the deck is stacked against them, maybe from government, media, scientific community, whoever it might be. The negative is that yes, sometimes people can get obsessed 
and any kind of obsession is is um, you know damaging and uh, unfortunately I think sometimes there are researchers or individuals who need more out of life that than what an interest in ufology or cryptozoology can provide and maybe they begin to um, fill their investigations with hyperbole so that they can get more attention um, maybe they start to take an experience and a, embellish it um, too far too much and it's attention that they need it does happen so there there is that negative uh, side to it and sometimes yeah just like a religion or a philosophy of any kind uh, they might be using that to fill some kind of void in their soul in their heart in their psyche i'm sure there are some differences between the communities but there are some commonalities too and and I think that's very interesting. It's whatever you believe about UFOs, about Bigfoot, I think actually it would be quite interesting almost sociologically to look at those communities. So not looking so much at UFOs or at Bigfoot, but at the people that study them and, and research them and maybe try to go out. I mean, I don't know what the difference is, for example, between people that go out on a sky watch with binoculars and infrared uh, equipment, night vision goggles, and say the people that hunt Bigfoot. And I, I suspect that one, one common thread is, is extreme dedication. And these things aren't easy. They, you probably get ridiculed and disbelieved, and you probably spend a lot of cold, wet nights um, when it might be easier to um, drink some beer and watch the game. So it's an interesting question about these different communities. And as I say, I'm sure there are, there are some things that bind them together and other things that set them apart. I think by and large, most people, um, especially in the paranormal community, I love the people in the paranormal community. Um, you know, it's just, just part of my tribe, uh, <laughs> as it were. And they're good people. And we are very supportive of each other. And I really appreciate that. And there's a lot of positive thinking. So I was into the whole UFO thing prior to being into Bigfoot. Uh, my introduction uh, was through a French comic book on aliens. But inside they had like a story from Brazil about little hairy monsters that were supposedly aliens. So when I saw another book on the Yeti, I kind of recognized that model, you know, from the earlier uh, UFO book. So that got me interested into the Yeti. I'm like, oh, it's kind of like, you know, this uh, UFO story in Brazil. Then obviously that went on to its own path, but. It, even five years ago, a UFO person, oh, those Bigfoot people, they're stuck up. They don't know, they're, they're you know, they're tracking something, you know, we don't really care about them. And then the Bigfoot people would be like, no, those guys are weird, you know. I spend my weekends out looking for a big hairy bipedal ape or something but those those ufo people are weird and because a lot of bigfoot researchers and understandably so are very scientific very hard fact we want footprints we want photographs we want hair samples we want dna we want sounds we want actual tangible evidence and ufo being a lot of sightings and encounters and hearsay having even less physical evidence than ufo world there was always a departure when I got invited to speak at UPARS LA, which is the LA chapter of MUFON, UPARS Universal Paranormal um, Association, and then MUFON Orange County, very nice people. It was really refreshing because I'm so used to talking to people, unless it's a paranormal podcast. If I just talk to regular people who have an interest in it, you spend the whole conversation about Bigfoot trying to convince them it exists. And when you go talk to a group of 30, 40, 50, 60 people who study different alien races and UFOs and consciousness and different astral planes and metaphysics and all this different kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, my name's Matt. I research Bigfoots. They're all like, yeah, and there's a big hairy North American creature exists. They're like, yeah, and it's no big deal to them. I mean, when, when you're talking about parallel dimensions and wormholes and ancient aliens and civilizations and the real kind of out there stuff they talk about to them, an undiscovered species or an ape is just like, or a species of humans. They're just kind of like, 
yeah, what of it? And they were very interested and very welcoming. And I heard some weird stories from some of the people who came up during the intermediate. Hi, I'm a level three shaman and I live in the woods here. And I want to let you know that Bigfoots are spiritual creatures. And I saw one one day and I could see it perfectly clear, but my boyfriend couldn't see it. And it spoke to me in a dream later that night. And I'm just like, hi. And I had other people come up to me and they're like, uh, yeah, we're actually Satan worshipers and we worship demons and are all gothed out and everything like that. And I'm just like, hi, I'm Matt smiling politely, you know? And, um, they're telling me that, oh yeah, Bigfoot has, you know, some of the dark ones seed in it and they're genetically modified and all this. And, um, the great evil one showed me this in a dream and I'm like, yep, it's nice to meet all you folks. You know, I mean, give them, listen to these people, listen to them, hear what they have to say, you know, whether you throw it out personally is up to you. But it's certainly fascinating, it's certainly entertaining at the very least. Bigfoot, in my opinion, is the Nephilim. The Nephilim are the byproduct, the offspring of the fallen angelic host and the human women of Earth creating a hybrid known as the Nephilim. It's biblical, it's right in there, Genesis 6. It goes back to the seed of a dragon will be at war at enmity with the seed of the woman, which sets up the rest of the biblical prophetic narrative. That's not taught in most seminaries. Most Christians have no idea what that even is. But it's there and it's coming into light. And I'm one of the people, my, my, my mentor, Chuck Missler and Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, I stand on their shoulders. They stand on G.H. Pember's shoulders. So it's been there. People have talked about it, but the mainstream still goes, whoa, 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 that's too woo woo for us. So again, it, this is all supernatural in my opinion. The whole UFO phenomenon, in my opinion, is a supernatural occurrence, not a, uh, an extraterrestrial one, an inter interdimensional one. I don't necessarily have to believe everything I hear. And obviously I don't just swallow and believe whatever evidence is you know, placed in front of me. But it's the conversation that I enjoy. Because what it says is that we're not being dogmatic. We're keeping the door open. We're asking questions. Even for the, the strict, almost dogmatic ufologists. Or Bigfoot researchers who say, no, Bigfoot is a physical being only. He's an ape family, descendant, living amongst us secretly. Whereas others would say it's an interdimensional being. Either way, they're, they're searching for something. And they're keeping that door open a little bit. And I really do appreciate that. One of the things that I encounter on my YouTube channel and in my research and shows that I've been on is just because I talk about a theory doesn't necessarily mean that that's what I think is going on. You know, just I talk about a Bigfoot UFO connection or a paranormal connection. And Matt thinks they're, they're paranormal or he thinks that they're the Nephilim or he thinks there's something biblical or they think they're, he, Matt thinks they're an alien. Well, well, I, I didn't say that. I feel like any good um, researcher or teacher or somebody exploring a subject, you have to look at these things without that necessarily being what your opinion is. So I got to put that caveat out there right away. I'm, I think I'm probably more passionate about Bigfoot than I'm about UFOs because, well, first of all, I have a BS in anthropology, so, you know, it, it's something that I can justify <laughs> going to school for five years, you know, in one sense. But for whatever reason, that's captured my imagination a lot more than maybe UFOs. I mean, I'm passionate about UFOs just as well, but I'm a little disillusioned by the, everything that's went on in the UFO field, you know, and it, it's a mess, if I'm going to be quite honest. And... There's a lot of people don't have the best interest of the field in mind, and that's, you know, that's really frustrating. Bigfoot's it's a little bit smaller community, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people I don't personally like, but it, it's not as tainted, you know, as the UFO field today, I think, and I think there's a bigger chance for us to find proof of Bigfoot in the next year than there is of us, you know, finally, you know, declaring that, you know, aliens or whatever, you know, creates the UFO phenomena is real. The term UFO, it's really, it, it encompasses a lot of modalities. It's not, we're not just talking about aliens, we're talking about secret aircrafts, maybe, whatever, right? And it becomes, there's so many factors involved. And it factors in so much into the political world, right? Because we're, you're talking about a new type of energy, probably, that's, that's very different than what we have today. And that affects everything, everything in the world. It affects oil, it affects government. I mean, imagine the U.S. government admitting tomorrow that, Aliens UFOs are real and they've been violating our airspace. 
for generations and there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, even today, which, you know, it's things are a little chaotic with the U.S. government, but even that admittance is like, is unthinkable, right? How do you admit something like that? And I think that's part of the problem why we're not getting UFO disclosure. With Bigfoot, you know, let's say someone discovers Bigfoot and not a greater creationist, maybe up at arms, you know, but ultimately everyone's going to get over it a week later. Oh, look, we found another species of man that's alive today. That, that'll be huge, right? Or we found a new type of ape that's bipedal. So maybe the ape thing will be popular for a week and no one will care, you know, the, or obviously if we find another species of human, that's going to change things dramatically. But look at the world today is really anybody's going to be up in arms about it a month later. Sadly, probably not, you know, not people go back to their phones or. I suppose if, if the, you know, humans are being abducted, I wouldn't see any reason they wouldn't abduct a Bigfoot too or. And the fact that in the last few years, you have seen a lot more crossover. Ron Moorhead, a lot of bigger Bigfoot researchers have given more talks at UFO conferences and they're starting to show up more. And you're starting to see a lot more crossover. Because I think both communities are kind of realizing this isn't just some physical creature in a craft, some species visiting us from another planet. There's more to it than that. These stars are too far away for them to even travel at the speed of light and get here. There's more to aliens than just them being little green men from another planet. And then people look at Bigfoot and there's more to these creatures than just being a big hairy human ape hybrid thing. And so there's a lot of crossover. Who's to say Bigfoot's not a shapeshifter that, you know, <laughs> one second he's, uh, you know, a bear-like creature and the next second he's like an old Indian chief. And you know, oh, hey, what's up? I, you know, who knows? Anything's possible. Coincidentally, that's kind of where my research went is eventually, and a lot of people encounter this in the Bigfoot world, is you've read all the conventional stuff, you've been out in the woods and had probably more than likely very, very limited success on your own. Researching Bigfoot in the field, you spend all day long camouflaged out with your cover set and your face painted, crawling through the woods, watching every step, setting up cameras. You go back to the car and you stop to take a whiz on a tree and that's when you hear a tree snap and you hear a hoop and you're like, I'm not ready, you know? Or as soon as your camera dies, you've been filming all day and you're tired and you're sitting on the porch and you're gonna have a cocktail. That's when you hear a tree knock over here and you hear a tree knock over there and you hear the woods go quiet and you hear a whoop and you're like, the camera's inside charging with no SD card in it. And you're like, really, really? Now that's when it happens and you go get the camera and then nothing happens. That's just the way it happens with all paranormal. The, and that's when you start getting into the ghost hunters. The people that go to the haunted, you know, the abandoned prison and abandoned insane asylums and the old houses and try to do their EVPs and talk to the ghosts and everything. Because they have a lot of the same issues. It's like Zen, the harder you look for it, the farther away from it you're gonna get. And it's very interesting that the UFO world, the Bigfoot world, and the paranormal ghost world all kind of seem to have that. I don't know. That, I was wondering where you're, how, what the link was between Bigfoot and, you know, and the UFO culture. And, and I'm understanding a little bit more now, for sure. For all of you out there um, that, that love these topics, thank you. Thank you for, for doing what you do. Because I think that on the periphery, even though maybe we're the ones that um, are willing to put our faces out front and publicly discuss these things, on the periphery, there are people that are watching and listening. Um, maybe they're not posting on their Facebook page, you know, latest article about cryptozoology, but they might see our posts. Um, maybe they tune into radio shows and they never talk to anyone else about it outside of that. They don't talk to people at work or family. It's just kind of like their own little, um, you know, mystical world that they created. The similarities at conferences where you've got big crowds and, you know, everybody's listening to the lectures and so on. I mean, that's pretty much the same, whether you're talking about UFOs or if it's cryptozoology. What I've found is that the lectures that are done in cryptozoology are far more visible in terms of pictures um, and imagery, you find that lectures and conferences uh, in relations like Bigfoot are far more picturesque, you know, location pictures, uh, pictures of the witnesses, um, you know, shots at the local lake where something's been seen, pictures of Bigfoot casts. So in other words, the imagery for the audience is huge. 
you tend to find very often with UFO lectures, it might be like two shots of the Roswell crash site, somebody presents a document, and there isn't really as much visual material as there is, you know, going out to, as I've done a lot of times, like Puerto Rico's El Yunque Rainforest looking for the um, Chupacabra. Um, I've done a lot of lectures where I've probably got 40 pictures of the places we went to, but you just don't get that with, you know, lectures on the Lotus UFO case. There might be a blob in the sky and a picture of the researcher pointing in the sky. So that's a big difference as well. Yeah. But I have heard of a lot of UFO and paranormal type connections. And for every Bigfoot encounter was, yeah, it scratched his butt and walked across the road. There are things that it vanished. It cloaked like the predator. I saw a big flash of light. Its eyes were glowing red. I don't mean eye shine from a flashlight. Its eyes were glowing red at me. I felt an immense feeling of fear, of dread, like I was going to die. And it had glowing red eyes. And when you start getting into things like that, or it cloaked, or it disappeared, or you start getting into things, and from people who are scared to death and seem plausible, why would they make this up? And then you're like, well, do I throw this encounter out? No. Well, some researchers do. I don't blame them if you want the hard science. But for me, well, let's, let's listen to these people. No, they're all different. I'd say they're all different. Everybody comes at it from their own way. We had Linda Moulton Howe back in the beginning of the, the first show, and we had Stanton Friedman, one of his last um, speaking engagements before he passed. But um, you know, just you know, we have a great group. It's cool to have the people come through Big Bear. I don't know, Bear kind of covers the whole spectrum. And Nick Pope, is he's just, he's fascinating to, to conversate with. There's a lot of parallels in the UFO world. People, it's very post-traumatic stress. Bigfoot isn't supposed to exist. Monsters aren't supposed to exist. Monsters aren't supposed to be real. But then here you're confronted with a Bigfoot, seven, eight, nine, ten foot tall, built like the Incredible Hulk and has a mean look on its face. You're at its mercy. If it wanted to come over here and tear you in half, it could. And it's kind of like that with UFOs. You're at the UFO's mercy. It's something you don't understand. So you have a post-traumatic type thing. You have a shunning of you're weird, you're out there. Oh, Bill saw a UFO once and Bill's weird. Or Matt, oh, he's, 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 he's the weirdo guy who's into Bigfoot, you know. Like I said, it's all fun and games until you see one. And then you go to the cover-up and then you go to some of the more out there things that we were discussing and there's a lot of parallels. And then I think uh, one thing the UFO world, because they're so driving for credibility, even more than the Bigfoot world, is you look at MUFON and a lot of the big organizations and they have a very strict, rigid way that they conduct their investigations. That's great. Time, location, temperature, what was the traffic conditions on nearby roads? What kind of, what was the environment? What was the state of mind of the person? Were they calmed? Were they agitated? Did this person have a history of mental illness? Did they appear to be intoxicated? Are they into drugs of any kind? What, what was the conditions? Were there any other witnesses? Is there any other historic? They're very, very good. And I think the Bigfoot world could learn a lot from that, from doing almost a law enforcement type investigation, you know, just the facts. I know it's kind of fascinating the whole disappearances and like uh, in some of the national forests too. And what's that all about? I've done a bunch of research in there and, and it's like walking with somebody one second and then they're just gone. And then sometimes stuff turns up, you know, pieces of their luggage or their gear or whatever miles away where there's and, you know, the time frame doesn't match and who knows? Abducted, I don't know, you know, Bigfoot ran off with them or who knows. One thing when you get into military witnesses and police officers, when you work in law enforcement, you're a trained observer. You're meant to look at a crowd, you're meant to pick out things, you're meant to interpret things that you have training and you have background and you do it for a living. So when you have military and law enforcement, there are plenty of sightings by cops, plenty of sightings by firefighters and lawyers and judges. When you get into military and law enforcement, these are trained observers. And when they have that, how much more credible do you want it to be? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It always seems like there's some hard evidence that um, changes their life forever. And they're like, I, I went from a non-believer to a full believer in, in a second, but it's, I've always trusted it. I always say, trust no one. 
And it's healthy, very, very healthy to be suspicious. We've all heard that line before, trust no one from the X-Files. But you have to ask, like, what does that really mean? Because if I have subscribed to the mainstream media, or if I subscribe to what I was taught in school growing up, and then I have this realization later on that what I've been told is not entirely the truth, and I start discovering new information, and I get that sense of, of betrayal, then I'll start looking at other sources of information. And those other sources of information may offer some truths, but those truths can be mixed in with falsehoods. And let's just say mainstream media or what you're taught in school, let's say there's an agenda there, if I look to some other source and they may be telling me some other truth that they weren't telling me, maybe I will believe that. But if they had agendas, how do I know this other person doesn't have an agenda? And we have to be really, really careful. So I think you have to look at all aspects of a conspiracy, all aspects of evidence, whether it's cryptozoology and ufology, and try to be objective as you can. It's okay to entertain all these um, theories and explanations as to what the phenomena is, but whether it's a conspiracy like QAnon or whether it's a government cover-up of the Roswell cra crash, if you believe all conspiracies, then none of them can be true. And so I just think it's healthy to step back, be objective, you know, enjoy the the the, the prospect of discovering truth that has been hidden from us. I think that's very fun and exciting. But you need to be responsible and not just shift your faith from one voice to another voice to another person to another source um, wholeheartedly and blindly. So that that's a very slippery negative side to all of these topics. Personally, I do think at some point or another we've had contact with aliens and I think maybe at some point or another we've had their recovered craft or given to us technology, which is where stealth, you, you look at where technology was 20 years ago and you look at where it was 50 years ago and you look at where it is now. Microchips and lithium batteries and all that kind of stuff and every new plane that comes out is already, you know, they say that we're 30 years behind what the government and labs already have, you know. And I think that's very true. I think they're getting it from somewhere. I think some of it could be very well reverse engineered. You know, where did titanium come from? How do you smelt it? How do you work with it? Aluminum even in the 40s and 50s coming up was a very new thing. Where do we work with all these different, how do we, you know, things that we've had, but how do we work with it to microchips, to battery technology, to touchscreen technology, to propulsion, to all these different things. And it seems to me that it's coming from some other place other than our own minds and our own research. The government either officially um, in some capacity has some contact and continuing contact with alien races or interdimensional, whatever these creatures are. And they're probably more advanced than us and we're probably getting some kind of a trade. Either they're trading humans for abductions or experiment purposes for technology. Who knows what kind of you know deal in the dark's being made. So yeah, I think they definitely want to keep it under wraps. And it kind of, you know, we're alone in the universe and we went to the moon and we weren't asked to leave the moon and the space program and all our modern science and Columbus discovered America and all that. It's all predicated on what we know in our science. And I think when you introduce aliens, not to mention religion and God, there's a lot of questions that come up if you suddenly acknowledge aliens existed and they're more advanced. And, and when you start getting into a lot of alien stuff about there seems to be multiple and even hundreds, even thousands of species of aliens, some that look like insects and some that look like big Nordic people and some that look like the little gray aliens and everything else. And some are good for us. Some are benign. Some are evil. You know, if you want to, some don't have our best interest in mind. So I think it's a big can of worms for the government. Yeah. So for 10 to 13 years, I was a director of investigations from UFON Los Angeles, where my job was essentially to go out and investigate, you know, UFOs. And in that time period, I've I'm sure I investigated over 300 cases, you know, obviously a lot of them I was able to kind of debunk right off the bat, you know, but there's enough there that was really compelling, including we had a case in Pine Mountain, which is about an hour and a half from Los Angeles to two hours. It's a little community. And um, we had a case where uh, an object was seen flying above someone's house by 
different witnesses from different houses on two consecutive nights. Uh, they claim they landed in the forest and they saw occupants. And if it wasn't for the quality of, you know, of witnesses, I'd be a little skeptical because we're talking a pretty far out story, right? We're talking about occupants. But this just came from a former uh, correctional officer. And like I said, it corroborated with a neighbor that saw it and independently. And not only that, but we walked to the forest and found the spot where supposedly it landed. And there was this big round circular uh, mark uh, in the middle of this field that, you know, was hard to dismiss con considering the stories we just heard. So normally a sighting would come in, someone would either... Uh, they would fill out as a database from you found people would fill it out and then that gets funneled into like different sections around the country where there's different chapters right and uh, los angeles probably gets the most amount of sightings just because it's a big you know it's a big community and stuff and um so that comes so i get emails i used to get emails about sightings and it was my job to either assign someone to do it which really if there was anybody else besides me you know occasionally people would come in for about a month or two and then they would quit and then it was my job to follow up. And um, usually, you know, most people kind of just make a phone call, you know, and then, you know, fill out the database and all that. But I have a little more interest in it, so I was always trying to go meet with someone. So then you go to the spot. You try to go at the same time where they've had their sighting around the same type of conditions, just in case if it's something mundane, you, a lot of times you can see it rather like, oh, look, it was a blimp because it comes around around that time, you know. And then you kind of, you know, depending on what the case is, you kind of go from there. I was looking this morning, hoping to find something. Is it Think harder it, to find? It's definitely harder to find good footage of Bigfoot than it is of UFOs. When it comes to the UFO stuff, uh, you get into cattle mutilations and you get into places like the Skinwalker Ranch where they had UFO sightings. There are certain places, if you follow my channel really deep in there, I, I call places of high strangeness. There are places like Yosemite National Park, which is a missing 411, missing person capital of the world. Hundreds of people in the last 30 or 40 years have gone missing in Yosemite National Park. Lots and lots of missing people. I think in 2017, there was 10 or 12 people that they never found. And I don't mean tripped and fell or fell down a mountain. I mean, just stories of kids, kids too, elderly people where they're 15, 20 feet and they go around a rock or around a corner and then they're never seen again and found days later in weird circumstances. In these areas, we'll have UFO sightings, strange lights in the skies, and then we'll also have Bigfoot encounters too. It seems like they just get this paranormal, you know, to me, it's like Bigfoot is 99%, well, it's probably 80% human, 19% ape, and then 1% something we don't know. Something like, if the paranormal is a pool, it's got its big toe, it's kicking its toes in the paranormal to pool. It's not a paranormal entity, it's not like a ghost or something like that, or a demon. But it definitely has that side to them. So there are all sorts of different theories that I've heard out there, that Bigfoots are spies for different alien species. I've heard encounters from people who've had habituations with Bigfoot families, who where their family lived on a property for many, many years, and they're Bigfoots that live in the areas, and they would trade with them or talk with them. And uh, even some people would communicate with them, learn part of their language. It's out there. It's stories I've heard, though, you can either confirm or deny. Talk that when Bigfoots get to a certain age, they go with the star people and then they come back. I've heard stories like that. And then there's other stories of people, you know, a couple of guys out in, you know, out in the country drinking beer on their tailgate and the UFO lands and Bigfoots get up. Uh, one of the most exciting aspects of similarities between ufology and cryptozoology are associated events. Cattle mutilation. Often you see orbs, um, people have witnessed lights in the sky, UFOs associated with uh, cattle mutilation, uh, crop circles, and Bigfoot sightings as well, encrypted events. So what does that mean? If Bigfoot is nothing more than another ape family member in the hominid branch that has yet to be discovered, our cousin, you know, out there, I've heard a lot of good explanations as to why we haven't caught them on camera. But at some point you would think, why, why haven't we gotten enough evidence with hair sampling and DNA testing to just outright prove that there's a brand new species? I know there's some good evidence out there. But ultimately, with all the, the cameras 
No one has caught a Bigfoot, really, except for the Patterson film. So what what is Bigfoot doing that keeps them so elusive? Of course, we have tracks and that sort of thing. I think I think there might be something else going on here. I know it it's you know getting a little bit out there, but the more and more I think about it, I, I feel like the idea that extraterrestrials as people suspect them to be, are simply these physical nuts and bolts beings that are coming here. Um, or that Bigfoot is a physical being just living in the woods. May not be entirely true. Uh, it seems to me that Bigfoot has the ability to slip in and out of detection far too easily for some mammal that's just yet to be caught on film. And with extraterrestrials, they too seem to have a will over physics or reality as we understand it, and can manipulate uh, the world that we see with our five senses and slip in and out of that view as well. And because those two things are happening and we see events where they overlap, Maybe, just maybe, um, these are these are beings that are beyond uh, just biological. Here's the problem a lot of people have with that. And here's the problem a lot of people have, and I seem to be defending those people who believe these things are real without question now, and I'm not really doing that. But here, here is something I will say, I guess in their defense. We are curious by nature. What we have to be careful is, is that, that we don't automatically assume we know the answers and project that answer on the research. If someone comes knocking at my door at two o'clock in the morning, immediately I think, uh-oh, something's wrong, or that could be somebody trying to rob me. That's a different supposition than Oh, I just saw something walk by my window. Oh, that could have been a ghost or a Bigfoot. That's an immediate conclusion that you've projected. The proper way to handle that is, well, I wonder what that was, or I wonder who it was. So you turn on your lights. Maybe you go to another window and investigate. And if you never figure out what or who it was, you don't immediately project an answer without any evidence. And that's what a lot of people do. On the flip side of that, that gets people in trouble, and that's what makes this group of people so anti or, or drastically opposed to the investigation and pursuit in the first place. They look at those people who are very misdirected and have good intentions but are very misdirected, and they say, well, that's the, that's the standard of reference for people who believe in mysterious things or want to go out in pursuit and search of the unknown. Well, in reality, that's not. That's not true. Those people who just automatically assume that, you know, this is all bonkers, it's good to be a skeptic, but it's not good to be a cynic. Don't be cynical. Just be skeptical. That's why I like Joe Nickel. People hate that guy. Has a PhD, I believe, in English from the University of Kentucky and works for an organization that pretty much goes out and debunks things. I respect Joe Nickel because he apply, he doesn't make fun of anybody. He applies that scientific inquiry and integrity to the question. And he really wants to know the answer to the question, but he's not going to immediately assume that it was Bigfoot, an alien, Loch Ness, the Nessie from Loch Ness, or ghost, or a demon. He doesn't jump to those conclusions. There are other people, however, who are so close-minded they don't even want to investigate. Joe will investigate because it requires them to reorganize their worldview. See, we all have a worldview. And if we were to find out, if we were to have an, an, an experience, if we were to go hiking through the woods and come upon one of these creatures, if they exist, and it's incontrovertible proof to us, and we are looking eye to eye, 
at this creature and we live to tell about it, we have to then reorganize our entire worldview. Yeah, and just, it's, all, it's fascinating. I mean, Bigfoot's a given. All you gotta do is find one. I just don't know if you're gonna do it on Bigfoot hunters, you know? Eventually though, eventually we'll all wake up, I would think. If you look at it from more of a scientific hard fact, if you accept the possibility of alien life, if you then want to make the leap to people are seeing UFOs, and UFO means unidentified flying object, it just doesn't necessarily mean alien, it just means we don't know what it is. And if you take the other leap and want to go and, yeah, I believe aliens visit the Earth, I believe, you know, the crash at Roswell and the government cover up, and and you believe that, you know, on occasion, uh, you know, these alien species want to do abduct people for whatever reason, nefarious or good. They want to do experiments on us. They want to collect our DNA. They want to study us. Just like, amazingly, oh, why would aliens want to take people and study them? What do we do when we go study species as humans, as biologists? We tranquilize them. We tag them. We radio collar them. We take their height. We take their weight. We check their teeth. We check their claws and then we release them back in the wild. We do it every day with bears and mountain lions and coyotes and badgers and gorillas and chimpanzees and crocodiles and everything else. So it would make sense to me if I was an alien life form and I wanted to study earth for whatever reason and I was abducting people, what are these very large hairy people that hide out in the woods? Maybe I'm gonna abduct them too. Maybe they are genetically manipulated by an ancient civilization. That's a theory about them. Maybe they're genetically manipulated by aliens. Maybe some ancient civilization tens of thousands, 20, 30,000 years ago had some advanced technology. Maybe we're not the only ones that ever had what we call technology. Maybe they had influences from aliens. There's all sorts of theories on where their creation could be, some of their more paranormal abilities, some of the sightings of people like there's been a lot of reports. I've talked to people from military bases who worked on military bases as MPs and stuff, and they would see UFOs sightings all the time. And it was always, don't ask, don't tell, you didn't see anything. But they also had a lot of Bigfoot encounters too. Bigfoot's coming up to the fence and the lights would flicker for a second and the Bigfoot's on the inside of the fence. Strange stuff, you know? And the guards on the perimeter are like, yep, we see Bigfoots, yep, we see UFOs. They're like, it's a weird ass world out there, you know? And these are soldiers, these are people, you know, they don't have anything to gain. You know, actually, most, a lot of people want to remain anonymous because you have everything to lose by talking about Bigfoot. So there's definitely a connection there. What it is, no one can definitively say. If I ever get abducted by aliens, I'm going to ask them, you know, hey, before you guys, you know, do your thing, what's the deal with Bigfoot? Is that you guys or is that another tribe of aliens or species of aliens? Is uh, What's going on with that, you know? And see, we have as humans always been at the top of the food chain. You know, we're supposed to be the smartest species. I question that every day. But if you come face to face with a bipedal creature that stands about eight, and, or eight or nine feet tall and is smart enough to have evaded detection and capture and live in the areas and the environments that they live in just fine, then we have to reorganize our worldview. A certain portion of the UFO community, which is, it's a growing portion too, it's pretty big, think that Space Force was specifically announced because of the alien presence of UFOs, you know, and that, you know, the, the White House, you know, Trump and Pence and all that are in, uh, in on the secret and they're secretly fighting, you know, aliens, you know, on the moon or whatever. Starting right here and right now, because this moment is your moment, it belongs to you. I don't buy that at all, personally, and I'm okay with the Space Force thing. You know, I'm not a fan of thinking military first in terms of space exploration versus scientific exploration, so that bothers me a little bit, but I'm okay with it, but it's just, that's not how any of this works. Now, you know, whether you like Trump or not, regardless, I, I don't care, but that's not, president isn't going to be in the know, not a guy that's from the outside of the, if anybody knows, it's someone that's involved in the military industrial complex, you know? And that would be maybe Bush would be the last, the father Bush would be the last guy maybe that would be in the know. I don't, I don't think necessarily presidents know the whole story. And certainly they're not going to create a whole space force just to fight aliens. I mean, that just sounds like fantasy to me, you know? Yeah, I think of all the presidents, the, you know, the uh, older Bush, I, 
has really talked about UFOs, if ever, but I think it makes sense in terms of, he was a CIA guy. Those guys, you know, have, aren't going to talk. They're in it for life, you know, and if anybody out of the presidents from, from baby Bush to Clinton to Trump is going to know anything, he would be the guy, but it would be the last guy I would expect to actually talk about it, you know. I think it's so compartmentalized and it's such a need-to-know basis that so few people know the, the whole story. And I don't think any of the presidents, certainly not the vice presidents or, you know, it's become very popular now, right, for someone that's running for president. They're like, well, I'm going to disclose, I'm going to look into the alien thing. You can see, I see these articles or this post on Facebook almost daily now. It's just not the way it works, you know. With Jimmy Carter reporting some years later, he didn't immediately do it, but several years later when he reported the UFO, it went into the annals of history. It is now a documented UFO reporting. Again, that is a scientific term. If I were to walk outside my front door and see a bright red glowing object in the sky that I couldn't identify as a plane or the Goodyear blimp, which I, I don't understand, I don't think it would ever glow and be orange. <laughs> if I have no evidence to the contrary, then I'm just going to say there was an unidentified object flying in the sky above my home. That's a scientific explanation of the unknown. It's, it, it, you know at that moment that it was A, flying, and it was B, unidentified. And you can identify C, the location. That's the best you can do. Those are all very accurate statements. So what Jimmy Carter did, he brought an air of credibility to the reporting. But Jimmy Carter was, and still is, at 96 years old, a very credible individual. I, I surmise he lost the presidency in 1980 to Ronald Reagan because he was just too honest. And that's what we've got to have. That, that is one thing we've got to look for when we do research into the unknown. And we try, to, we, we try to resolve these issues and solve mysteries. You have to look for the more credible, the more reliable resources and reports. You have to, and, and that's why it's so important to know the people reporting these phenomena. The other major difference between ufology and cryptozoology is the evidence. Cryptozoology doesn't have nearly as much supportive evidence compared to ufology. And I know that ruffles some feathers. Yes, there are uh, footprints. Yes, we have some sampling. Yes, um, we have some video, not really the best in general. But ufology has a rich history all the way back to the 1947 Nathan Twining memo, Lieutenant General Nathan Twining, openly in his report, speculating that craft witnessed by pilots and, and uh, military personnel could possibly be something that's off world. And there's a rich history all the way through a numerous public and secretive projects. Um, regarding the investigation of UFOs. And that leads all the way through Project Blue Book up until the ATIP program. And so you combine that with the number uh, of eyewitnesses who are pilots and military personnel that have come forward over the years. Uh, Colonel, Colonel Philip Corso, I mean, controversial as he may be, you know, there's a rich history there. People saying, look, I worked behind the scenes. Um, and this is what happened. This is what I saw. And so when the government is spending so much time, energy, and resource and money into investigating UFOs, um, there must be something there. Whereas with cryptozoology, you just don't have that. Um, you know, I guess, I guess if the government thought that cryptids were more of a um, national security threat, then they would maybe investigate those things. I, I don't know. Um, you know, we had we had psychic programs only because you know for remote viewing only because the Russians were doing this. So would we have ever looked into um, using psychics? to remote view unless the Russians were doing it. So that's a national security issue right there. Um, so that's the only reason I could think that maybe the government would investigate. I think that the problem is so many cryptids 
um, get mixed. And there's a crossover effect between imagine pure imagination of you know creatures from our mythologies to actual creatures that have been eyewitnessed um, or blurredly caught on camera. So there's just I I, I support actually spending more time and energy and money into investing cryptids and i think that there's a lot more that can be done and i think that in ufology there's just been way more collective resource put into the investigation from civilians and the government and institutions and uh, academia in general there's just not nearly as much effort investigating cryptozoology so that's a whole nother door that i think that that should be opened well, in terms of um, my favorite evidence for UFO sightings is probably my own sighting, which uh, I had as a kid. It was, uh, I was about, I was age 10. And I lived right here in Los Angeles and we were hanging out by the pool with my mom. And I believe it was a hairdresser was there at the time, you know? So I hang out by the pool, probably maybe eating something, getting some drinks, it was pretty late. Well, I wasn't drinking alcohol, you know, I was 10. But, but, and then all of a sudden we saw this big light that kind of came down and hovered above us about 30 feet above our heads above the pool. Uh, completely silent, uh, about, you know, 30 foot across, about 30 foot up in the air, so about 30 by 30. And it stayed there silent and it kind of either blinked off or took off. And all three of us saw it. And so after seeing something like that, even at age 10, and, you know, as you get older, you kind of go back and you're like, well, maybe I misunderstood what I saw it was a helicopter or whatever, but, you know, I still asked my mom once in a while. And to me, I just can't deny what I saw. So from that standpoint, that's by far the most believable, you know, UFO um, event. Otherwise, I mean, you, you know, you look through history, there's that, there's a lot of, anything that has to do with like fighter pilots or airline pilots that see UFOs are obviously very believable because they're trained observer. I even interviewed a, a pilot that was an Air France pilot and uh, he was a 747 at the time pilot. He told me that he used to see UFOs pretty regularly in cross-Atlantic uh, flights. And he's like, I'm going to be honest with you, he's like, a lot of us have seen them. He showed me a map, in fact, of where all the sightings took place from like various pilots that he interviewed. And it was like, it was filled. It was filled. He had all these dots everywhere. And he's like, we all see them. We all know they're there, but, you know, we, we don't want to lose our jobs so we don't talk about it, you know. So that kind of evidence is obviously, you know, extremely compelling. And I was reading this this article from a science website, a credible science website, where they've recently found um, evidence that there could possibly be a life-sustaining planet in, or planets in other systems. That we're kind of to a point now where we're almost ready to accept that that is a distinct possibility. So if that's a distinct possibility, and we've done really well in this on this planet, then there is certainly, um, there's certainly the possibility that life is developed quicker and more intelligently and more technologically advanced in other systems who are trying to contact us. I have never seen any evidence of that, but I keep a very open mind. That doesn't, that doesn't really scare me. So most people would tell you that with UFO sightings, it's pretty random, but I don't believe that's the case. Now, granted, a lot of them are pretty random. You know, because it occurs all over the world, right? But there's definitely specific areas around the world that have a long history of sightings, and they're still current. There's uh, Kazakhstan, for whatever reason, hot in the middle of nowhere, there's a lot of sightings, Siberia. In the United States, you have the St. Louis Mountains, uh, St. Louis Valley, I'm sorry, which is in uh, southern Colorado, which had sightings for generations. And uh, until, and still today, you have a plethora of sightings, you have cattle mutilations, a lot of related phenomena in a very in a smaller geographical area. And I think that we don't spend enough time going to those spots that have a long history of sightings. So you get to a point where your research with Bigfoot, where you've read the books, you've watched the documentaries, and you're like, I want more. And then you start looking in the UFO world. You start looking in not just Bigfoot, but the bigger cryptozoological umbrella. And you start realizing all across the United States, I mean, my primary research is in the United States, but all over the world, you're like, Parts of the United States, they're seeing a goat man. Parts of the United States, like in Loveland, Ohio, they're seeing a giant frog man. So yeah, I think you get to a certain level with your Bigfoot research where you almost have to start looking at the bigger cryptozoological umbrella. 
you have to start looking at the paranormal side of it. What are ghost hunters experiencing? What are they doing? What are the UFO people doing? How, how do they conduct their investigations? What do they do with witnesses? What problems do they have? And you realize you're all kind of, it's different subjects, but you have all the same issues. What I enjoy most about both cryptozoology and ufology, honestly, is the camaraderie. The people in those communities, I just so enjoy having conversations with them and working together um, with them. There's a lot of support and um, and I think that might come from the fact that often people, I think, see those of us who are interested in these fields as a little off. Um, maybe like we have dissociative um, dissociative disorders or something, um, or that we're sad and uneducated, and um, and that's really unfair. In fact. There's a lot of very smart people that are investigating these things. And we have a sense of humor about this stuff, too. Um, you know, we get it that, that we're discussing things that are like just totally out there. Um, but that's OK. That's part of the fun of it as well. And uh, and I think that, you know, because you can be judged harshly for having these sort of interests that in a way it almost brings you together and um, it causes you to have some sort of uh, empathy for each other, um, a connection, that sense of belonging to a tribe, as it were, uh, and that, you know, that we will be there to support and um, defend each other. You know, a lot of people talk about this closure, but they're waiting on this, like, almost like on this Messiah to give you this closure, and that's not going to happen, you know, obviously. I mean, every year it's like, yeah, this is going to be the year. You know, I think we should be focusing a lot more on being proactive and hitting those areas that a lot of people want to go into. You know, instead of reacting, you know, be proactive, which is, in a sense, the same way we do Bigfoot research, right? We try to be proactive, go and get the evidence and found, you know, Bigfoot ourselves. And I think whatever strange, you know, phenomena or modalities you're dealing with, I think that should be the approach. Are they, are they, do they, are they meat eaters? I would think, right? And what? hunt a bear, go tackle a bear, cook them up. I don't know. If I was a Bigfoot hunter, the first thing I would be going after is, well, what is this, you know, let's do some, let's spend some real quality time researching what we think this thing eats and, and go where the food is, follow the money. Like Bigfoot, so when you go research Bigfoot in the field, now occasionally it'll be just like a UFO setting where you'll get a sightings report somewhere in an area and you can follow up on it. but. A lot of times it's a lot more remote than a UFO sighting, so it's very hard to get out there, you know, in time, you know, and it costs money and time and all that. The crossover between cryptids and extraterrestrials, UFOs, is that there's this meeting of the tangible and intangible. And I love that nexus where both of those worlds meet. Um, our understanding of time-space is expanding. Our understanding of the very structure of the nature of reality is almost getting looser and more interesting. It's expanding as well. And that means there are just perhaps infinite possibilities. And so if we imagine something to be real, if we imagine that we can traverse the cosmos and be at the another part of the galaxy within just a few minutes. If we can imagine that consciousness exists everywhere, almost simultaneously, if science teases that all these things are possible, that there are multiple dimensions, then of course, why couldn't there be cryptids walking side by side, living right amongst us, and we have no clue. That, that to me is fun. It's like, I, it's just fun. I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but it, it's fun. That makes life really interesting, and I don't need it to make life interesting for me to, to, to be happy or to be content. Um, but it's like science, right? Uh, 
reading the latest news in science, um, the latest discovery. To me, that's fun. I love it. So um, that nexus where all those worlds meet is probably the most exciting thing about uh, cryptozoology and ufology. Um, there's too many uh, eyewitnesses, and it's you know they're hard to take a picture of because they're you know shy of people. I was just watching something this morning on where they took a print of a well, we got a baby Bigfoot and then, like pour the mold and everything. And they're talking about how the toes were uh, spread out different than our toes are um, pushed in because we wear shoes all the time. And they're like, this is this is the evidence of that. And that's pretty interesting. But ultimately, I think that both fields encourage us to say, yes, take a look behind the veil and see what's there. That's exciting. There's a buzz there. And living in that mystery, um, I think, gives one a sense of connection to something bigger than themselves. And because these fields are, for the most part, non-dogmatic, meaning unlike a religion or something, right? There, there are not a, a set of rules that someone says, you must abide by this, you must believe this. You can have that spiritual search through these mysteries without anybody saying um, your spiritual belief or your um, sense of wonder or your curiosity is inherently evil or wrong or bad. Uh, I find it really freeing. And, um, you know, even if we find out something is not true, that's okay. I'm glad that we went on this journey together. I'm glad to be a part of the, the community and the people out there who do this. Um, you know, it's for me, ultimately, it's all about peace and love and harmony and um, compassion and empathy and caring about each other. And the paranormal world is a playground that says you don't have to have all these boundaries that institutions or governments or your local culture or societies or history has said that you have to abide by. Um, it's like in the Big Lebowski when the when the dude says the dude abides. He's not abiding by the rule of society, right? Um, he's abiding by something bigger. And it means not taking everything so damn seriously all the time that sometimes you've just got to let go, go with the flow um, and enjoy. And um, for me, that's what the paranormal is. It's really just letting go and enjoying what discoveries or stories I might find along the way. Gosh, I would think there it's it's always been around. It, it goes back to the uh, there was a fascinating thing with the Cherokee Indians and in that they would uh, put like grains or something at the edge of their camp and the, to feed them and they would come up and take them and and go back into the woods and it, it was like their peace offering and they would protect them. And that's, there's no, I mean, yeah, Indian, there's no reason to, to doubt any of that. You know, and they, they probably have, are more able to see them because they're less fearful of them than the standard human, especially like a Bigfoot hunter. Get out of here. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, you, Good luck seeing one. Are you bringing your gun too? They're like, no way. I can smell the gunpowder. I'm out of here. I'm not gonna get shot. But I, it's I don't know. Yeah, and why don't why haven't maybe there has been one in captive? I mean, there's no reason to think there wouldn't be, but I wouldn't think he'd be that happy about it. And I don't know. Is there female? There's got to be female Bigfoot too, right? <laughs> So the UFO world is a much bigger paradigm. And, you know, if you think about it, a UFO sighting can occur anywhere in the world. And there's a lot more interest and people report those a lot more versus the Bigfoot phenomena. You have to have a very specific geographical area for that space to live. So I think from that standpoint, you're naturally going to have a lot more interest and a lot of more people talking about UFOs and aliens. And, and I think people are naturally more interested in the whole UFO thing because it's about, it's about 
the future. It's about going out in space and what's out there in a the bigger picture, you know? Bigfoot doesn't seem quite of as big story from that standpoint, so I think there's much less interest in Bigfoot than there is, you know, in UFO and aliens. They are a community. They may be a diverse community. There may be some, let's not kid ourselves that there aren't some fairly crazy people involved in cryptozoology and in ufology. Let's not kid ourselves that there aren't some charlatans and fraudsters in, in both these communities. But essentially, most of the people are involved, whether they're witnesses or whether they're researchers, are sincere, dedicated individuals who are intrigued by a mystery and want to push the boundaries of human knowledge. And rightly so. I mean, that's, that's what being human and being intelligent should be about, pushing those boundaries, asking those questions, trying to expand um, the, the sum of all human knowledge. And if that takes us into some difficult and uncomfortable territories, well, you know, that's how we maybe make big advances through adversity. You know, investigating the paranormal, it's like the light on the hill that you're sort of looking out to. Um, it's not necessarily that that light is the answer, although maybe you will find the answer to the big questions, and I love asking the big questions, but it's the journey. And so going towards the light, meaning what is out there, what is in the distance, what's behind the veil that we don't quite see, but we, if we keep going that way, we'll get answers along the way. That's exciting because Hopefully we do learn about ourselves, and I think I think we do. I think we become more accepting and loving and tolerant people, and forget tolerance, accepting people, because we're, we're entering this weird world where anything seems to be possible. And I think that if you're going in with that mindset, then for the most part, there are exceptions to this rule, your, your brain is more el elastic. You know, you're able to adapt to new ideas, to keep an open mind. And that is to, is the core of the ufological and cryptozoological uh, community.